you know, from time to time <clears throat> around here, we publish a magazine called The Scribe. And it's filled with stories of uh, God working in the lives of people here. And you'd be really encouraged if you read it. There, <clears throat> the recent issue is all over the foyer. It's in all the stands out there. And, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of hear sometimes what's going on. Big picture, you hear from the front. But there's so much that God is doing in the lives of people. And we try and pick some of these stories so that you'll hear them, be encouraged. And so the scribe is out there. Uh, make sure you pick up a copy if you haven't got one already. Well, his name is Reverend Jabok Goo. Reverend Jabok Goo, G-U-U. He's a Korean pastor, and he's new to our city. And I heard this summer that he was coming, so I, I said to Wilma, um, I want an appointment with him. He's coming to be the pastor of Knox Presbyterian Church. So he arrived at the end of August, and she made an appointment with me, and I had lunch with him a couple of weeks back, Reverend Jabok Gu. He's a young man from Seoul, Korea. He's probably early, mid-30s, got a son in grade five, and I think a daughter in grade two. He learned English in 2020, and now he's pastoring in Red Deer, Alberta, Knox Presbyterian Church, maybe 30, 40 people. And we had a great lunch at um, Original Joe's. And during that lunch, I said, um, Jay Bach, I said, you've been in Seoul. He came, he went Seoul, Vancouver, Red Deer. Um, I said, Jay Bach, can you tell me the difference between the church in Seoul, Korea, and in Vancouver? He hasn't had a chance to get an idea of what's going on in Red Deer. Can you tell me the difference between church in Seoul, Korea, and Vancouver? And he looked at me, and you know, that's easy. He said, we pray there. He said, there, we all get up at five in the morning and go to church and pray. And then we go back and get ready for the day. He said, that's the way I grew up. That our parents took us five in the morning to church to pray every day. And then they brought us home and got ready for school. Isn't that cool? <laughs> You're not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, are you? You know, I, I listened to him, and I felt like such a spiritual pygmy next to this young man. And we got talking, and I said, so what are you going to do at Knox Presbyterian? He said, first thing I'm going to do is start a prayer meeting. And I said, of course you are. Um, but since then, I, I, it hasn't left my head. And I've looked at the church in Korea. You know what's going on? It's flourishing. It's alive, and people are streaming into God's kingdom. There's got to be a connection between prayer and bringing the church to life. And, and I thought about it, and I thought, you know, and Jesus said to pray for the Holy Spirit, because if you ask the Father for the Holy Spirit, he won't say no. I think that's what they do. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, there's life and flourishing and people coming to Christ. But here's the deal. It'll always cost you something to follow Jesus. You have to give something up to follow Jesus. You always do. So you know they give up sleep, but the result is incredible. And I don't know what it looks like in Red Deer and Central Alberta yet, but I'm asking the Father, show us, show us what we need to do here because we need what they have there. And if you think of Reverend J. Bot Goo, pray for him. It's, uh, he's new. Didn't know much about Alberta. Okay, nothing. He just learned English. He's pastoring these people. When you go by Knox Presbyterian, pray for him. Pray for that church because God will bring it. You watch, that church will come to life because the Holy Spirit will come in answer to the prayers of his people there. I want to take you to a passage today that is all about the Holy Spirit bringing life and flourishing and all of those kind of things. It's in Ezekiel. I, I know we've been in Ezekiel for three weeks. We looked at Ezekiel 36, 37, and now I want to take you to Ezekiel 47, and Pastor Jordan is going to pick up from here next week and take us right into a passage that builds on what I want to talk to you about today. So in Ezekiel 47, you read these words. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water 
coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east, and the water was flowing from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and led, then led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the desert where it enters the sea, that is the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There'll be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Eglium, and there will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Great Sea, or the Mediterranean. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They'll be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear, because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. It struck me when I read this that nowhere is this vision explained. It's just not explained. Ezekiel doesn't explain it. I don't think he understands it. The effect of that is to leave us standing there on the banks of this great river pondering this amazing vision with Ezekiel, trying to figure out what this is all about. And as you think about it and start to join some dots, some things I think become a little bit clearer. You're dealing with a river, but it's a, a river of life. What we have here is a life-giving river. Wherever it flows and whatever it touches lives. So you, it's clear, at least that's clear, that we're dealing with a life-giving river. Question is, what does this river represent? What is it all about? If you were to study some of the history of Bible interpretation, there's a large group of people that, that believed, especially when I was growing up, that this account, vision, prophecy, applied to an age that some people call the millennium. Some people believe that after uh, Jesus comes back, he'll set up a thousand-year reign on earth. And they say that this applies to that that there'll be a temple built then and a river, a literal river flowing from it. In other words, they interpret it literally. I struggle with that on a, at a number of levels. One would be this. Then why should we read it today? If this has just got to do with some period in, down the road where there'll be a temple and a river, then what's it got to do with me? I mean... There's fishermen along, along, maybe it's encouraging me that be, we can fish. I don't know. But what does that got to do with me? The other thing about it is, what's this temple deal? Um, I thought revelation, meaning scripture, was progressive, not regressive. In other words, you have a tabernacle in Exodus which becomes a temple, you come into the New Testament and the church is now the temple. In fact, my body's the temple. Why, why would you go back and build a, a temple when we've gone past that? Furthermore, the temple was the place of the presence. If Jesus is really here, we don't need a temple. I struggle with that interpretation. There's other reasons, but that for sure. I when I have trouble understanding Scripture, one of the things you can do and I do is I try and compare Scripture with Scripture. In other words, is there any other Scripture that would shed any light on this at all that would help me understand what's going on here 
And I was reminded of John chapter seven. Let me just read something to you from John seven. These are the words of Jesus. And um, listen to what he says. It's the last and greatest day of the feast. Jesus stands up and says in a very loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, here's a line, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the spirit whom, he, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Do you get that? Jesus says, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. And then he said, as the scripture has said, I'm assuming that's Ezekiel, streams of living water will flow from within, within that person. So it seems to me that a better way of understanding this is to see the river of life being the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is a life-giving river. The Spirit of God is a life-giving river, and everything he touches lives. Wherever he goes, he brings flourishing, the Holy Spirit. Now, if that's the case, then this is gonna take us further than what we thought about last week in Ezekiel 37. There, the Holy Spirit brought death, dead people to life by breathing into them. That's great. Here, it's not just life, it's transformation. So you have life, but now you have transformation. This is a life-giving river, a life-giving spirit that brings transformation wherever he goes. So if the river of the Spirit hits your heart, it'll bring you to life. If the river of the Spirit hits your marriage or your family, it will flourish. If the river of the Spirit ever hits a church, that church will flourish and come to life like never before. That's the way I understand this text and the way it's working. Um, probably worthwhile to just think about the context for a moment. Have you ever read through Ezekiel? Well, I see that hand way at the back. It's a tough book. Um, you, get into, you get into parts of this book, and you know what happens? You bog down, especially around here, because starting in chapter 40, you're dealing with a, the temple, and this same man that showed in the, shows in the temple, and the measurements of the temple, and how it's to be built, and all these other things. It's like, what on earth? And, and then you... You, you get to the, um, I think it's Isaiah, or Isaiah, Ezekiel 43 and verse seven. And he says, son of man, this temple is the place of my throne, throne and the place for the soles of my feet. This is where I'll live among the Israelites forever. In other words, this temple is the place of the presence. It's gonna be unspeakably holy. And so as you go through these chapters on the temple, there's so much attention to detail Everything matters to God. Now, if I'm right in saying that we, the church, have become the temple and my body the temple of the Holy Spirit, then what it means is what God indwells is unspeakably holy. That means this house, this church, these people. It means you and me. Just like that. Temple. And God is concerned about the details, not just the big rocks, not just about whether I sleep with another man's wife, not just about whether I steal money, the details he's interested in. So, for example, if you look at the book of Proverbs, it's about details. Proverbs will talk to you about um, not eating too much. It'll talk to you about um, not sleeping too much, making sure you get up during harvest and get the harvest in. Proverbs will talk about your words. I mean, Proverbs will talk about details because details matter to God because what he lives in is his. It's unspeakably holy, the whole thing. So you, as you work from Isaiah, or Ezekiel rather, I keep saying Isaiah, Ezekiel 40 to 47 here, you got this emphasis on holiness because the temple's where God's gonna live. And then what a change when you come to chapter 47. The emphasis here now is on flourishing and refreshment and God blessing. And so we learn to balance God's holiness with this desire to bless, this desire that we flourish. This holiness isn't something that, 
that is meant to repel us. It's meant to draw us in because when you meet this God, he's a beautiful God, wonderful God, whose desire is to bless his people. And you come to um, Ezekiel 47 and you realize it's almost, it's almost as if the flourishing and blessing eclipses the holiness. It doesn't, but it almost feels like that. So you get the two things together. And so you're, you're confronted with a God in Ezekiel that is unspeakably holy and on the, at the same time wants to pour out his spirit on his people and bless them. So that they, he wants your marriage to flourish, in other words. He wants your relationships to flourish. He wants you to experience life and life to the full. That's what you get when you place this in its context. So having said that, I think in the time remaining, I'm just, I'm gonna ask you to notice three things here, just three things, okay? Um, and, and you either right on the surface of the text. Number one is this. I want you to notice the progression of the river. The progression of the river. It, it starts this way. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple. Now, if you dug into that, what it would mean is a trickle. In fact, the picture behind it would be something like this. It would be maybe a jar, a little bit bigger than this. But if I poured this out on Mark and Terry here, which I won't do, you'd hear a trickle. That's what Ezekiel says I saw. I saw a trickle like somebody was pouring out a jar of water. I saw a trickle. Then he said, I kept watching. And what happened was the trickle became a bit of a stream and, and it was ankle deep. He said, I kept watching, and down the way, it was knee deep. A little further along, it became waist deep. Then he says, at some point, it became this massive river that was so wide, nobody could cross it. A trickle to a massive river that nobody could cross. And then you'll notice verse 6. This man, whoever he is, says to Ezekiel, son of man, do you see this? Do you see what's happening here? Do you see what happened? A trickle to a mighty river. Do you get that? I don't know if he did any more than we would do. But when he says to you, see this, it must mean that this progression is very, very significant. What could that mean? What's the significance of that? Well, I, I, I know people that think this, and I, I think this to a certain extent too, that it probably represents the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. That in one sense, it, it starts, we come to Christ and you know, we get the living water, but we don't know much, and it's like a trickle. And as we grow and we should and we go on, that God gets more and more of us, I guess, and the Holy Spirit begins to fill us. And, and you know, as you, as you get on in the Christian life, and you know, surely by the time you've walked with God for a long way, this river of life that's in you that Jesus said will flow out to others should be like a mighty river. I think there's something to that. But I think there's more. I remember, wasn't it Joel, that says, in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. I don't think that Ezekiel has seen some millennial period where there'll be a temple and a river I think he's seen our day. I think he lands this vision in our day. The last days were the days that began when Jesus went back to heaven, and they last until he comes back from heaven. So he was resurrected and went to heaven. The last days begin. He comes back from heaven, uh, last days end. So we are living in the last days. I would push it further and say that I think we're living in the last days of the last days. Now, in other words, it's, a, it's the age of the Spirit. It's the age when the Spirit was poured out. The Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. So I think what Ezekiel's seen, and you, you're wise people, go home and ponder it and pray about it, and if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But this is what I, I as I ponder, this is what I think is happening here. I think what Ezekiel has seen is the Spirit being poured out from Pentecost till the time Jesus comes back. As Joel said, I'll pour out my Spirit in the last days. And I don't think Joel limits it just to Pentecost. In other words, Acts 2. I think what you're seeing here is this Spirit that was poured out at Pentecost, and it's, you know, just on a group of people, 
in a very um, um, localized area. But as the age goes on, I think we can expect more and more and more of the Holy Spirit being poured out. Until just before Jesus comes back, there's this great outpouring of the Spirit, and many, many people are swept into the kingdom of God. I think you're getting a picture of the age of the Spirit. The time Jesus left, the time he comes back, and there's a progression. There's more and more of the Spirit gets poured. You say, ah, that's, that's another Danism. Um, maybe. Well, you know why you would say that? Because you live here, and I live here. You wouldn't say that if you lived in China. You wouldn't say that if you're in Ethiopia today. You wouldn't say that if you're India or Korea. There is a mighty river of the Holy Spirit being poured out on this planet that you wouldn't believe if you were told. And it's unstoppable. It's unstoppable in China. It's unstoppable in India. It's unstoppable in many parts of Africa. Ron Pierce will be here in two weeks with Empower Ministries, and he will tell you what God is actually doing around the world. He said to me and Pastor Tracy one time when we met with him, I can't even tell your people how many people are coming to Christ because they wouldn't believe it. They just wouldn't believe it. But he said, it's unbelievable what God is doing in this world. The question is, why isn't he doing it here? And so the danger is to interpret this by our experience rather than by what Scripture says. And I think this progression is highly significant. God says, I will pour out my spirit, and he's doing it. Now, that's the first thing I want you to notice. Second thing I want you to notice would be the source of this river. Where does it come from? It says it comes from the temple. It starts from the temple. What's the temple? The place of the presence. It's the place of the Spirit of God, in other words. It, it God lives there. It, it's from God, from the Spirit of God, if you like, that the river flows. That's where it, that's where it com- doesn't come from some kingly palace. Doesn't come from Washington, D.C., or Ottawa, or Edmonton, for that sake. Doesn't, doesn't come from these places. It comes from the temple. Now, if I understand that the church is the temple of God today, what's supposed to happen? The river of the water of life is to flow out from the church to central Alberta. There's supposed to be life flowing out of this place. There's supposed to be water that gives life to everybody. Um, That's another way of saying that the church is the hope of the world. If there's to be any hope at all, it's got to be in the church. You know, I just started... I got depressed, so I stopped. But this morning, I started looking at the headlines of the day. 80, 87 people killed in Gaza that were in homes last night. It's obliterated. A um, number of people die in Georgia when a wharf collapses. Ukraine had some missiles dropped on them, and people die. CTV Calgary News had two or three murders, Calgary on the weekend. I look around and I say, where's the hope? Where's the hope? It's not in, it's not in our politicians, although some of them are really good people and do good things. It's not there. They make promises, but they can't keep them. It's only the church of the living God that has any hope to offer a world that's completely broken and desperate. And Ezekiel's vision will tell you that the Holy Spirit is meant to flow out of us as individuals and the church like a mighty river, a life-giving river that points people to the source, which is God. He's the source of this river. No one else. Now, notice where the river flows, thirdly. So you have the progression, you have the source. Where does it flow? Down in verse 8, it says, this water flows toward the eastern region down to the Arabia or the desert. It flows to the desert. This world is a desert. What better description could you give to this world than desert? It's a desert. That's where the river flows. Isn't that good news? It flows to the desert. I, I thought Ezekiel had a pen, or Isaiah, now I'm getting them all mixed up. His friend Isaiah had a penetrating insight on this. In Isaiah 41, Listen to these words. 
The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst. Isn't that a vivid description of the people you and I know? Poor and needy, looking for water, parched, there is none. But I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I'll make rivers slow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I'll turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. Isn't that amazing? Does anybody get excited about this? Like we should be out of our seats. This is amazing stuff. I'll put in the desert the cedar and the acacia, the myrtle and the olive. I'll set pines in the wasteland, the fir and the cypress together so that people may see and know, may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. Here's what God says. I look around the place, central Alberta. There's a desert. People are parched. They're trying to quench their thirst one way or another. And God says, but they, it's not working. But he says, I'm not done. I, the God of Israel, I'll pour out water on the dry ground. And I'll turn the desert into pools of water. Do you think this is just a picture of something sometime, somewhere? This is, this is what God wants to do. This is what God wants to do. Here's a God that wants to, to quench the thirst of thirsty people, and he does it by his spirit, through his people. And so that's where the river flows. But notice it also flows somewhere else, not only to the desert. It goes to the desert, and then it enters the sea. That means the Dead Sea. When it empties into the Dead Sea, the waters there become fresh. Now, that's astounding. You ever been to the Dead Sea? I have, twice. Now, we, we're talking about a lot of weight here. And I threw myself in the Dead Sea, and I couldn't even go under. Like, that's amazing. Um, you, you float on the top of it, and it's so salty that if you didn't shower after, you'd be in serious health trouble. Um, nothing lives in the Dead Sea. Nothing. He's saying when the river hits the Dead Sea, transformation, it comes to life. The river flows to the desert and to what's dead. What's dead in our society? What produces death? Pornography, pedophilia, perversion, human trafficking, false prophecies. Hey, give me money and I'll make you rich. That's, they all traffic in death. God says, I'll pour out my spirit and my spirit will hit those things and turn them on their heads and bring life to where there's death. Do you believe that? Or do you think things just have to go on the way they are? Like, I sometimes think, are we playing church? Come here, we sing nice songs, we hear a good message, we go home and meet a few nice people. But what changes? Does your street change? Your school? your workplace? Do I change? Like, this stuff is meant to change us. This is meant to inspire us to say, Lord, do it. Do it in our day. Do it in our time. Because we got, we got desert, we got death everywhere. And, and God says, I'll pour out my spirit. Listen, I, I believe this with all of my heart, that before you see Jesus come back, you'll see the greatest outpouring of God's spirit ever, because that's the way the river flows. And Jesus said he wasn't coming back for a crippled, half-asleep church. He said he was coming back to a beautiful bride that was ready and prepared in every way. Do you think that just, do you think that means that when we see him all, he'll just snap his fingers and poof, we'll be what we should be? I think it means we're supposed to be like the virgins that get themselves ready in the parable that Pastor Julie talked to us about a while back. That, you know, we're supposed to be ready for this stuff. Um, not half-asleep. I can't believe, and maybe you can, but I can't believe, I won't believe that the devil will get the last word on this planet, that he'll drag more people into hell than the work of God's son on the cross would bring to heaven, which must mean this, that he'll need to pour out his spirit on the desert and on the dead places. So what? So what? That's great. Oh, before I get into the so what, time is it? 
11.59. You guys got a couple more minutes? The other 500 can leave, but you guys stay. It wasn't, I'm just joking. Um, when the river hits the Dead Sea, it says, fishermen will be there spreading their nets, all kinds of fish. It's got to mean more than we get to fish in the millennium, if there's a millennium. It's got to mean more than that. Somehow it reminds me of the words of Jesus who said, I will make you fishers of men. When the Spirit's poured out, we become fishers of men and women. We do. When the Spirit's poured out, it's like when... It's like when Jesus was resurrected and these blokes had gone back to fishing and they caught nothing all night. He's standing on the shore. He says, you should, you should try the other side. And they do. And they catch so many fish. Their nets are breaking. They need every boat that they have. That is what happens when the Spirit's poured out. So many people come to Christ that we won't just need to bang out this wall. We'll need every house and every church and every available. There'll be... More people come to Christ when, when God pours out his spirit than you could ever plan for. And you have to trust the spirit then to lead you and guide you into what to do. And then another thing just to notice, it says fruit trees. I think that's first. Does your Bible's print shrink too? Mine does. It says fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear, because water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Did you catch that? Every month they will bear. Put that side by side with Psalm 1. I'll tell you what Psalm 1 says. Blessed is the person that doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on that law they meditate day and night. Then what? They'll be like a tree planted by streams of water that bears its fruit when? In season. You see the difference? In season, Ezekiel 47, every month. Isn't that cool? In season is normal Christian life. Every month is when the Spirit's poured out. There's so much happening. So many people coming. It's like fruit all the time. It's powerful stuff. If this vision doesn't inspire you, I think you're half dead. Um, uh, well, you know, I mean, I love you, but it's, I think you're half dead. It doesn't inspire you. So what do we do? Get ready. Get ready. Be ready. How do you get ready? Well, First of all, you confess and you forsake all known sin. If you're fooling around with sin, get rid of it. Bring it to the Lord. Bring it to the cross. Ask him to forgive you and cleanse you. Ask him to, to motivate you and give you strength to, to walk in the right ways, but get rid of it. Because, listen to this. When God's spirit's poured out, he comes so powerfully that a lot of people start confessing their sins publicly. They'll come up and say, you know what? And, and this is what I did. And I don't want to do that. I don't want you to know my stuff. So I want to be ready. I want to confess it now to the Lord so that when the Spirit comes, he doesn't drag me up here. Say, and there's still grace on both sides. But I'd rather confess it to him now than, than having to do stuff publicly, which was... Always happens in revival. Always happens. So you, you, you say, well, I've, man, I got a truckload of stuff. I'm, I'm not good enough. God says, I have grace for you. You know what grace is? It, it says grace is greater than all of our sin. Grace is for the not good enough people. That's who it's for. Grace assumes that we're not good enough and we can't make ourselves good enough. Um, you, you, you don't get grace if you're good enough. You get it if you're not good enough. And so you come to God and you tell him where it's at and you ask for his grace and his forgiveness and he will not hold back because he's gracious and he's compassionate and he's slow to anger 
and he abounds in love to every person that calls on his name. Every person that calls on his name. That's where you start. And then you, well, you get started. Once you've done that, you ask God to fill you with his spirit and you can ask him every morning and you go out and you live for him. I, I'm just gonna reference Acts chapter four for a minute and make a couple of points here. You know, I live in a world where, you know, they say pastors have to have a lot of degrees and that, that's, that, that's bunk, they don't. Uh, it's, I guess it's good if they have them. I mean, maybe it helps, but you don't have to have a degree to be a pastor. You don't have to have a Bible college education to be a witness for Jesus. You just, you just go do it. Acts chapter four and verse 13 says this. It says, it's about Peter and I think his friend John. And it says, when the authorities saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. These uneducated, with no Bible degrees, ordinary people spoke boldly for Jesus in the marketplace and thousands of people came to Christ. They, they just, they trusted the Holy Spirit. They just got out there and got busy living their lives. As they're going about their lives, they're witnessing for Jesus. That's, they hung out with Jesus. You become like who you hang out with. Hang out with an Oilers fan and you'll become one, sadly. <laughs> you know, I mean, hang out with someone better, you'll become that. But I mean, you, become, you hang out with Jesus, you'll become like him. And nobody will be able to keep you quiet. So that means if I'm going to get ready, dealing with my sin, bringing it to the cross, I have to look at my agenda and make plans every day to make sure there's time for Jesus in there. You can't block him out and expect him to do great things in your life. You have to give him time. We're talking relationship. We're talking relationship that matters. We're talking becoming like the person you hang out with. And then I would just say, start praying. Start praying. Jesus said, if you ask the Father for the Holy Spirit, he won't say no. Start praying. Figure out. You may not, may not be able to get up at five in the morning, but say, Father, I, I, I want to be like Reverend Goo, and I, I, want, I want my life to matter. Show me what that looks like in my life. And he will. He will. So maybe I'll just end with the breath prayer and um, let me show it to you and explain it to you. This is a little breath prayer that we'll take this week. It says, my soul is small, Lord, please enlarge it. That gets at that idea of progression for sure. Um, I'll tell you where it comes from. This is a prayer that the great Augustine, who lived about 385 AD, prayed. Arguably, Augustine and the Apostle Paul are probably the two greatest Christian influencers in the history of the church. Augustine actually had three parts to this prayer, and I've, I've taken the middle part out for you. The first part he prayed was, um, my life is in ruins, Lord, please rebuild it. My soul is small, Lord, please enlarge it. Then he added a third bit. There's much in me that you see and do not approve of. I acknowledge it and do not try to hide it. Isn't that a great prayer? I pray that all the time. But I think for today, that second bit is huge. Father, my soul is small. When I sit with a, a reverend goo, I say, Father, my soul is small. Please enlarge it. Let's, let's pray that this week. And the God who hears prayer, tell you what, he'll begin to work in your heart. And I hope that we're never the same. Why don't you stand with me and I'll pray and, and then we'll worship and I'll tell you what we'll do after that. Father, we just, we come to you and we thank you again that your life-giving spirit has not been withdrawn from your people. I'm sure, Lord, there's things in all of our lives and in our church that block the flow of the spirit. Would you bring that to light so that we can deal with that? so that the river of the water of life would flow from within us, but also from within this church to Red Deer and Central Alberta. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.